I am President Ulysses S. Grant, and I welcome you joining me here in the library this day. And I should like to reflect with you upon my children. I had four of them. Julia and I married <clears throat> on August the 22nd of 1848. And on May the 30th of 1850, our firstborn child, Frederick Dent Grant, was born. He was named after his uncle, Frederick Dent, who I had roomed with at the United States Military Academy. Fred, uh, being the firstborn, was a joy to me. And when I resigned from the Army in April of 54 and came back to St. Louis, after being gone for more than two years, I was reunited with Fred and his younger brother, uh, Buck, Ulysses S. Grant Jr., but more about him in a moment. Fred was a bright child and uh, went to school with his brothers and sisters. And when the war started, he spent a good deal of time with me at just uh, 11 years old. In fact, he was with me on my first march with the 21st Illinois from Springfield, Illinois into Missouri. In fact, he rode my horse, Rondi. Uh, the Lieutenant Colonel, for whatever reason, I don't recall, did not go with us on that march initially. I rode his horse and I gave Fred my horse, Rondi. Fred was with me much of the time during the war, but I should like to talk with you about Vicksburg. He was with me on the boat when we watched the bombardment of Grand Gulf, Mississippi, and uh, crossed the river with me, and was with me throughout the Vicksburg campaign. Now, two instances happened with Fred that note mentioning. First of all, he nearly was captured going into Jackson, Mississippi after we'd gone through uh, Fort Gibson and Raymond, we moved into Jackson, Mississippi and took it. Fred got a little ahead of the rest of us and went into Jackson and to his horror, realized that the Confe retreating Confederate soldiers leaving Jackson were not prisoners. <laughs> they were still active soldiers evacuating Jackson, and he said that uh, his blue uniform, he had a little uh, uniform, we outfitted him, all the soldiers called him Colonel. He uh, was covered with dirt and mud, and he felt like uh, that that's what saved him, that he didn't have that Yankee uniform on when all these hundreds upon hundreds of Confederate soldiers were filing past him. He did later admit to me that even if he had been captured, while it would have made great notoriety, probably wouldn't have affected the outcome of the war. I think he was most magnanimous in granting that uh, would not have been a divergent matter in the outcome of the war. Also, after that, in pushing, in our last battle, pushing Pemberton across the Big Black River in the Battle of Big Black Bridge, uh, Fred got uh, ahead of himself and the other troops and got his blood up, leaped his horse over some breastworks and was in the thick of the uh, advance on the river. A Confederate sharpshooter across the river fired on him. Bullet ricocheted and hit Fred in the leg. Not a serious wound initially, but very painful. He fell on the ground as he would have spent many ball knocked him to, his, uh, to the ground. And uh, Colonel Lego, the, my aide from Galena, uh, rushed over to him and, and uh, are you all right? Of course, he was horrified. And Fred said, I am killed, I am killed. And uh, he flipped him over side to side and could find no wound. Finally, looked at, checked his leg and there was a little blood. Uh, but uh, he said dryly, I, I think you're going to live, Fred. Let's go tell your father. As it turned out with the surgeon, the surgeon wanted to amputate Fred's leg, and uh, I said no, absolutely not, that he uh, could uh, make it with the leg, and I didn't want 
him to miss going into the army himself. So uh, it was very painful, but the leg survived and so did Fred. He did catch a bug though in Vicksburg, uh, as did many, as, as myself, dysentery, and very nearly died uh, in January following the Vicksburg campaign. He never really got over the dysentery and then it went into typhoid fever. He was at death's door, but he survived. Now, in 1871, uh, 66 rather, he went to the academy and graduated uh, in 1871. Shortly after graduating from the academy, he went uh, out on civilian duty, had temporary leave, and went to uh, engineering for the railroads and was out west, uh, actually with uh, Sherman, and uh, went to uh, Yellowstone with the Yellowstone Expedition and was assigned to uh, the 7th Cavalry with Custer. Now, he had married on Ida Honoré in uh, October of 74, and she was pregnant, uh, heavy with child, with their first child. And uh, he was called home, given some leave. And it was while he was home with the birth of his child, first child, uh, that on June 24th and 25th, the Little Bighorn battle occurred. And it is quite likely that had Fred not come home for the birth of his child, that he would have been with Custer and uh, killed with the rest of the five companies that were massacred with Custer. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that he was home. And it saved, could have very well have saved his life. After the war, he uh, went to Europe for a year or so with uh, Sherman as an aide, and he uh, came back to the States, back in the Army. And in 1889, he was appointed by President Harrison, William Henry Harrison, to be uh, the minister to Austria. And he was there for from 1889 through 90, 91. And he came back, was uh, in civilian pursuits. And uh, then he was uh, involved with New York City Police Department. He was police commissioner from 1884, uh, 1894 rather, to 1898. And uh, actually worked with Theodore Roosevelt at that time. In 98, when the Spanish-American War started, he went back in the Army as a colonel, quickly became a Brigadier General of Volunteers. After a year in Cuba, he was sent to the Philippines for the Philippine-American War and uh, stayed there as a military governor and was uh, promoted to Brigadier General Regular Army. He came back to the States staying in the army, ultimately rose to become a major general and was in command of the eastern uh, side of the United States all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And at age 62, he uh, developed throat cancer, as did I, and died at about the same age I died. I had turned 63 in April and died in July. Uh, Fred died on April the 12th of 1912 at age 62 of throat cancer. He and uh, Ida Honoré had two children, and uh, I will not go into my grandchildren. So Fred died April 12th, 1912, married Ida Honoré, Honoré uh, rather, and had two children, West Point graduate, became a major general in his own right and died of the same thing I died of uh, at the same age, essentially, that I died. My second child was uh, Ulysses Grant Jr. And uh, he was born, he was called Buck because he's the only one of our four children that was not born at Whitehaven. And as soon as uh, it was seen that he was a boy, 
one of the ladies attending Julia said, well, he's a son of the Buckeye State. Julia resisted him getting the nickname Buck, but resistance was useless, uh, and he became Buck from the day he was born. It was, uh, he was our biggest child. He was over six feet tall. But Buck uh, had a good education. He went to Exeter, then he went to uh, Harvard, and then he went to Columbia and got a law degree from Columbia. He went into business, went into banking, practiced law, and married uh, Francis Chaffee, the son of Senator Chaffee, a daughter, rather, of Senator Chaffee. And uh, they had five children. In 18... 80, he uh, was approached by Ferdinand Ward to form the company of Grant and Ward, which he did. He then enlisted me, and which I happily joined the company. Neither of us knew that we were being duped, and uh, we were bankrupted in 1883 uh, and 84 and uh, May of 84, and it was devastating. I think he learned from his mistake because he later became a good businessman. He had married in 1880, but Fanny Chaffee, his wife, was, had uh, become fragile in her health, and they moved to California. Our youngest son, whom I'll address in a moment, had already moved to San Diego, California. But in 1893, Buck had recovered from the losses of Grant and Ward, had gotten back into business, had become a successful businessman in the New York area, and moved out to San Diego. He became involved in real estate and became very successful in real estate, bought a hotel, uh, tore it down, and built the U.S. Grant Hotel in 1910. And uh, I understand it is still standing to this day. Uh, Fanny died. He remarried in 1913. And uh, he ran for uh, public office or uh, as a delegate and in different political offices uh, in later life. He and his wife traveled a great deal, and actually he died while on a road trip in uh, September, September 29th of 1929, and he was buried in San Diego. They had the five children. Now, my third child, interestingly enough, was the only girl that we had, and she was born on the 4th of July, and that was Julia uh, Dent Grant. Yes, Julia Dent Grant. She was named Julia at my insistence, but then shortly after her birth, she was born July the 4th of 1855. Uh, her mother, Ellen Renshaw Dent, her grandmother rather, Julia's mother, Ellen Renshaw Dent, became very ill and died. And at that time, we renamed Julia Ellen Renshaw Dent in honor of her grandmother. So she became Nellie. She had a pretty good education, and uh, in fact, when she was about... 14, I sent her to Miss Porter's school, but she was a favorite, and uh, she wrote three telegrams begging to come home, as uh, uh, her brother Jesse did too. But she wrote three telegrams, asked to come home. I sent an escort and brought her back home. Now, she was 13 when I came into the White House, and she became something of a uh, call celeb or an item celeb because uh, it was scandalous. She danced all night at Washington parties and I had not the heart to rein her in and her behavior, but she was developing a reputation that was of a party girl and I didn't care for that. And there were a lot of suitors whom I felt to be unsuitable suitors. And I decided to send her on a European tour when she was 16. Sent her to England and to go to tour the continent, which she did. She met Queen Victoria, uh, who said that she was stiff and uh, uh, something uh, akin to stiff and dull or uneducated. 
she was felt to be a wooden head by British society. So apparently, as far as they were concerned, her education wasn't that good. But coming home, she met Algernon Sartres, who was a mid-level British nobility. I think he was about 21 at the time, 22. She was 17. And she was madly in love. And she came home, and she wasn't uh, too much of a wooden head, because when she announced that she wanted to marry, her mother, who was shocked that she wanted to marry, said, are you sure that you want to go out and face that cruel world uh, and leave this wonderful home? And she demurely, according to Julia, said, well, Mama, isn't that what you did? And Julia couldn't argue with that. So we had a White House wedding on May the 24th of 1870, and uh, Nellie by this time was 18 years old. And she went back to England with her husband, Algernon Sartres. And there were some concerns by myself on the part of him being a womanizer and a ne'er-do-well. And I wrote his father a very blunt letter asking him about the character of his son. His father, it turned out, uh, who was a member of parliament, mother was the daughter of a, a famous actress and was in her own right an opera singer. Uh, they were concerned about me and my reputation, legendary reputation of being a drunk myself. And so we became, in writing our letters, something of friends. We, we realized we were both fathers concerned about our child, children, uh, children rather, marrying the other's child. But they got married nevertheless, and they went back to England. They had four children, and the first one died at about a year old. The other three survived to adulthood. As it turned out, my uh, concerns were well-founded. He was a drunk, became an alcoholic, a ne'er-do-well, spent extended periods of time away from, from Nellie hunting, allegedly, in particularly in Italy. Uh, her, his parents actually encouraged them, her, to file for a divorce and made it clear that it, it was not her fault. Uh, he had fulfilled their expectations and had become a ne'er-do-well. She divorced him, moved back. Actually, she came back when I wrote her a letter talking about my illness in uh, 1884, uh, 85 rather, and she came back home. She must have been ready to come because within 16 days of me writing her the letter, uh, she was on the dock in New York City, and it's a seven-day cruise. So she was ready to come home, came home with the, the three surviving children, and stayed and helped to nurse me through my illness. After that, uh, she, he, he died, Sartre's died, which she felt free to her to remarry. And she married a, a Frank Hatch Jones, Frank Jones, who was a big Democrat uh, politician, a very successful Democratic politician, and they married in 1912. But sadly, not long after their marriage, she had a severe stroke that paralyzed her and she survived in that state for about 10 years and died on August the 30th of 1922 at age 67. And she is buried in the same cemetery that President Lincoln is buried in uh, Springfield, Illinois. So that was the end of her. Our youngest child was Jesse, and he was born February the 6th of 1858, and he was spoiled. He was spoiled. He was 10 years old when we went into the White House, and he had a decent education, but had moved around a lot, particularly during the war and uh, in his early years. But he had a good education. I, actually, I sent him to school, and he stayed two days and whined and complained and came home. Uh, he loved being in the White House. He Julia said whenever he spoke, we all stopped and listened, which we did. Of course, he was the baby. He was the darling. And 
more than a little bit spoiled. I was always an indulgent father, but with Nellie and with Jesse, I think I was particularly indulgent. Fred, uh, Jesse, though, did get a good education. He went to Cornell and got a mining engineering degree, and then he, too, went to uh, Columbia Law School and got a law degree. In 1880, he married Elizabeth Chapman. They had two children. And uh, by the mid-80s, just a few years after marrying, they moved out. He was the first to move to California, moved to the San Diego area. They were married. They had their two children. He became a Democrat as well and uh, uh, was successful. When Buck moved out there, he and Buck went in together into the real estate business, and they prospered and built the U.S. Grand Hotel together. He divorced in uh, 1913, remarried not long after that, and uh, died in uh, June, June the 8th of 1934. And Jesse is buried in the Presidio in San Francisco. And I might also mention that uh, Buck died of the... Uh, same thing that I died of, of throat cancer. So Fred and Buck both died of throat cancer. So the four children uh, all did well uh, in their own right. And two of them actually died of the same thing I did. Uh, and I won't go into the grandchildren. I, I want to limit my reflections to just the children. But Fred died in 1912, and uh, Nellie died in 1922. Buck died in 1929, and let's see, Jesse, being the youngest, also lived the longest. He died in 1934. So that's quite enough to say about my four children. I was proud of all of them, and I think they all did well. Uh, Julia, uh, Nellie rather, had something of a tragic life, particularly her last two years being uh, paralyzed. And uh, Fred and Buck both died of throat cancer, both heavy smokers and died of throat cancer, as did I. But I feel that for this time coming together, I have said quite enough in reflecting about my children. Until the next time that we come together for a reflection on the part of President Grant, I will bid you an affectionate adieu.